you know there's a saying how do you eat an elephant and the answer is one bite at a time the problem is if we've got a big goal how do we know that we are splitting it up or chunking it up in the right order so that we're building the right stuff in the right order and at the right time so in this video we're going to look at a very quick example of something as trivial as, as me putting up some posters in my studio and we're using two different approaches which result in a radically different outcome the other thing we're going to be looking at is how apple have used some of these lessons to determine when to ship and literally made billions and dominated multiple industries as a result of this we're also going to look at some splitting patterns and how we have are using this to our ongoing example of uh, justice inc the legal publisher that we're using throughout this series as an example. Hey friends, I'm Ahmed Eskeld, Agile and Productivity Coach based in the UK. On this channel, we are covering productivity, agility, and yes, even joy. So this is the fifth video in the PI Planning for Beginners series. Oh, it's amazing, incredible how time has actually uh, flown by. In this series, I'm walking you through step by step everything you need to know to run an amazing PI planning event. And as I've said, we're using this example of Justice Inc, the legal publisher, to show how they can set up an amazing PI planning event so that you can set one up too as well. So let's take a step back and have a look at why does it even matter how I split up a problem? So let's take this very simple trivial example of me putting up posters for my studio. So I really, just to give a bit of background, I really wanted something that actually spoke about my values, that reminded me when I came in the morning why I was coming into work and why I was putting in all of these effort. And so that was so that I could remember, but also so that I could share this with the audience and hopefully attract an audience that actually also aligns with those values as well. So the outcome was to put up illustrations that represent these three values something very simple and straightforward and let me show you the different approaches over here so approach number one is we've got we can select a photographer we can ask them to shoot some bespoke pictures or imagery or come come up with some some vector diagrams or whatever it is we can evaluate the pictures we can select those pictures we can professionally print them out and we can get them professionally installed so that's option number one that we have but there's something that i haven't told you that in addition to getting my message out and reminding first primarily myself and others as well well there was other things that were really important to me that actually impacted the approach that i was taking to set up this even this such a trivial project as putting up the posters if you could call it a project right and that was first of all i didn't have much time i have so much going on at the moment that i didn't want to spend too much time or devote too much time to do it so i wanted it very quickly i wanted it at a reasonable cost and also whilst quality and aesthetics is important to me i'm not in the printing or publishing business it didn't need to be of a, a, the ultimate quality something that was reasonably good that got the message out there was good enough for me and what i was trying to do is i was trying to obtain a feeling and give a feeling as well so that was the primary objective so let's have a look at the approach that i that i took and let's go quickly through why i selected this approach as well so the first step that i took was i needed to select the frame so I had options between a black frame and a white frame. So I bought both samples of both of those and I bought those to test the quality in terms of how it looked in the, in the place where it was going to be set up. The next thing I did is once I selected that, I then bought the remaining frames. And the reason for that was to minimize the regret cost. What I didn't want to do was to buy and spend, invest a whole bunch of money on frames that were never used. Once I'd done that, I identified the pictures that were going to go into each of these frames and I, I printed them out using a cheap printer that I've got, my trusty Canon, and I printed them out for a draft. I then put them up on the wall just just without the frames, just so I could test the positioning. And I did that to make sure that I had the optimal quality 
and the optimal position so that I could get my message out there as well. Okay. The reason I went for a draft was to reduce the cost, the effort and the time to market as well. Now, I had all of this stuff. I was now able to see how they actually looked and the idea was to go and now upgrade these and get these printed out professionally so that I could have that professional finish. But actually, now that I look at it, I think it's a pretty good result already as given what I want. So now, if you notice, the last step, I have not taken this step. Why? I do intend to take it at some point, but the ROI, the return on investment of time and effort and money, that has, that has now, doesn't stack up anymore. The priority of this item has now gone down my list of other things that I have to do. So what I ended up with is something that was, was what I wanted, it was appropriate in terms of the quality, the cost and everything else. So splitting really does matter because it does change the risk profile of your project and your program. It can impact your overall cost profile as well as your timelines. And also, if you, it may result in you being able to get an MVP out, which actually requires you to either pivot, or in fact, if the ROI doesn't stack up anymore, you can just cut it short as well. So it leads to a very good and best practice approach to actually project delivery, but we need to make sure we are clear on what we value as well. So let's have a look at how Apple have used some of these principles and ideas and how they've managed to dominate a market. On the 29th of June 2007, Apple with Steve Jobs launched the iPhone 1. These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. In those days, can you believe there was no video, there was no app store, there was no Zoom. They were using something called 2G edge network capability. Can you believe that? Oh my God, how would we survive without our app, app store? I have no idea. But the important thing is when you look at the competition, they knew exactly when they needed to stop. And because they got their stuff early into market, they were able to dominate the market and the industry, not just by in terms of the number of millions of units sold, but clearly by the profits, Apple being the most profitable manufacturer of phones by far in the entire industry. And so this was a difficult decision if you think about it, because the App Store itself, Apple knew was, a, a, was very much uh, building a platform and Apple uh, being Apple knew the impact and the importance of that. But the App Store wasn't released until a whole year afterwards in the 10th of July 2008. Now if we look at now how much the App Store is worth in 2020 <laughs> the App Store made, believe it or not, 72.3 billion dollars. Now that is how important the App Store was, but they delayed that for a whole year because they knew they wanted to get the key functionality out on the iPhone. And then after that, they released the Apple Store and they both helped to propel each other due to that synergy and getting greater and greater market share as well. So what are the lessons that we can take from Apple? I believe that there are four key lessons that we need to take away. So let's have a look at them. So the first key lesson is we need to be really clear, just as in the example that I showed, what is the most important element to us when we are actually launching our project. Yes, we need to be clear on the goal as well, but we also need to be clear on, is it market share that we're, we're wishing to target? Is it revenue that we're wishing to target? Is it the customer happiness that we're wishing to target? Is it the time to market or cost effectiveness that is the most important thing? We need to be really clear on that. The next thing we need to do is we need to be understand the importance of the time to market. 
because that can be worth, as you saw in the example of Apple, that can literally be worth billions and billions of dollars. The next one, we need to check the ROI rapidly and consistently. Every time we have a new increment, we need to check and make sure that the ROI still stacks up. Now, and then the last one, but certainly not least, is not to fool ourselves. We don't want to kid ourselves. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think of the iPhone, there were three big responses that happened when the iPhone came out. So the first one was BlackBerry and Steve Barmer's response. Let's have a look at that. The iPhone and the Zoom, if, if I may. The Zoom uh, was getting some traction, then Steve Jobs goes to Macworld and he, he pulls out this iPhone. What was your first reaction when you saw that? $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. Now, it may sell very well or not. I, you know, We have our strategy. We've got great Windows mobile devices in the market today. We, you can get uh, a Motorola Q phone now for $99. It's a very capable machine. Now, when you contrast this response to Andy Rubin's head of Android development at that time, it, the story goes is that he was driving in his car when he found out about Steve, and he was listening to Steve Jobs' uh, uh, announcement of the iPhone. He pulls over the car to watch the launch and, the, and decides to pull the plug on the existing Android development uh, that is going on at that time and start from scratch. So. Uh, really different responses to the same event. Steve Barmer, CEO of Microsoft at the time, and, and BlackBerry's response was very much, you know, uh, who cares? It's not a viable product. They don't have a keyboard, etc., etc., etc. And Andy Rubin's response was, oh my God, this is going to be a game changer. I need to pivot and adjust and uh, change our response as well. So it's really important in terms of not kidding ourselves and having a look at and having the maturity to have a look and see, okay, when this event has happened, we may not like it. We may not like the, uh, the results of that, but actually what we need to do is we need to take an honest, hard look at ourselves. And in video number two, when we were looking at the visions and the goals, we looked at the 12 cognitive biases really quickly. And if you remember, the fourth cognitive bias, which is on the screen over here, is called choice supportive bias, right? And that is once we have made a decision, we tend to sort of like focus too much on the benefits. We can kid ourselves very easily and we can minimize the flaws. So in example, we could say, you know, everybody needs a hardware keyboard on the phone. It's essential. Otherwise, you can't really send emails without it. Nobody's going to want to use it, etc., etc., etc. OK, and that's some way in which we can generally very easily kid ourselves as well. OK, so the question is now, how do we take all of these lessons and how can we start to split up our epics in a way which we can actually maximize and optimize not just the outcome, but also the approach that we actually use to achieve that outcome. So what I want to show you on the screen is a very famous story splitting cheat sheet from back in 2009. It's from Humanizing Work. And this is basically one of the original story splitting cheat sheets. And that's what I'd like you to, uh, to walk you through. We're going to use our own version for Scale Agile. But since this is the original, I wanted to just walk you through this as well. So you get an idea of what the concept is. So if you look at the cheat sheet, and there's a link in the description below as well, what you're going to see is you're going to see a, a number of different patterns. We call these story splitting patterns that you can actually apply to any context. Now it says user story, which is typically done at the team level that normally fits within a sprint, but we can apply this same patterns to epics or to features or to stories or to capabilities to any agile requirement construct that you're using. So let's have a look really quickly at the different types of structures that we actually have and the different types of patterns. So the first one is workflow steps. 
And over here, you can see you've got a content manager. He's publishing a new story. And the, the three different types of workflow steps, you've got some articles that can just be like, maybe they're just informal blogs or something that can be published. Then you've got others that are uh, may need an editor review and you have other more high value ones that need a legal review example. So as an example, we could split out these three different workflow steps and we could then notice each of them still deliver value. Okay. The next one is business rule variation. If you're searching for flights, you've got days, you've to search between certain time periods, different options in terms of search capability over there as well, based upon what rule you want to use. If you want to see uh, another option over here is for major effort. We've got a user over here. He wants to pay for the flight with Visa, MasterCard and various different types of credit cards. You've got a single credit card, which may be very simple to do. And you've got other credit card types, which may be harder to do as an example. Okay. You've got simple complex as well. Got, you can split up the problem into something that's relatively straightforward and easy to do. And you can learn from that. And then you can do and um, pick up the next bit, which is harder and more challenging to do. You've got variations in data. So for example, if you're a new site, you've got different languages, which you can split up by. You've got data entry methods. How do I input the information into the, um, into the system. So we could split by that. We can, we can split by performance, right? We can do one option where we don't worry about performance at all. And the other option where we care a lot about performance, we can do by operations, by creating an account, editing, canceling your account, etc. And we can do investigation as well, which is referred to as a spike as well. Okay. So here are some common patterns. What we're going to do now is we're going to see how we can apply these patterns to our own example. So we can really start to crystallize and learn how we can split our epics into meaningful features in this video. Okay. So let's recap on our PI planning for beginners example over here. So we have Justice Inc, as you may remember, and the vision was to be Earth's most reliable source of legal information. And it was going to be the first place where legal professionals go to obtain the latest legal information that they actually require. We put together this epic, which is around the awesome Aussie case law system. And we also had a bunch of benefits and business outcomes that we wished to achieve as well. Okay. So these, these spanned, I won't go through every one of them, but these were about, we wanted all of the information, case law and others from 1912 onwards. We wanted family, criminal and corporate cases, etc., etc. have at least, we, and we also wanted to have at least 10% of lawyers to be adopting our service by 2025. Okay. We have a bunch of leading indicators over there. We have a bunch of things that are valuable for us. Okay. Now these are really important because we want to make sure that we stay in alignment with these values. We've got one tangible benefit that we wish to achieve, which is market share. And we've got one intangible, which is customer happiness as well. Okay. And this is what we covered in the last video. Right now, what we're going to use for our example is I have put together some of our own patterns that we can apply in this case. So let's go through each of those in turn by turn. So the first is split by case type. That's referring to whether it's a family law or criminal law or corporate law. So why would we do this? So the reason is, is that what we want to be able to do is we can still release value and we can still capture a significant market share, even though we haven't actually released everything to for, for our entire market. So this is a valuable way of us being able to uh, simplify the problem yet still release value. The second is what are the most popular legal cases that are being used why? Because again, time to market is really important for us and we can get a system up and let's just assume that in about a quarter of the time, if we just go for the 20%, which, re which represents 80% 
of our market share as well. So what are those that are using the Preto principle? What is that 20% that actually represents the 80% of the market as well? Okay, so the next thing we're going to be using is, um, is investigations and spikes. The areas that we are unclear on, the areas that how do we get feeds from our systems, from the courts, how do we get our data? So we're going to need to have some spikes and investigations for that. Architecture. So now this is a relatively new system. So we're going to have a bunch of architectural features that we're going to need to put in place to sort of make sure that we build out the architecture. We're going to need to look at the different data types as well. Okay, so we're going to want to split out things by the different types of data that we can have. We can have case law. We can have precedents where we actually have a look and see how the law was applied in the past. And we can have commentary as well to explain to lawyers how, how what were the circumstances surrounding those decisions as well. So we've got three different types of data. And then finally, we've got different data sources as well. OK, um, and so whilst this is arguably a less desirable split, Nevertheless, because of the time scales involved and the different parties involved and the technical technicalities involved, it might be useful for us to actually have a look at a data source split as well. So let's take this and see how we can apply this to our example and how we can split our epic so that we can come up with a, an optimal. There's no such thing actually as an the optimal split. There's so many ways you can split it, but basically what we need to do is we need to make sure that we split it in a way that we achieve our objectives, we can maximize the value to the market, we reduce our risk profile of delivery and also of cost and also minimize our regret costs, similar to what I've already showed you in this video. So let's have a look on our screen as to how we can take these principles and how we can apply this to our example. So we have the awesome Aussie case law system EPIC, okay? And this has a bunch of different success criteria, as you can see over here. So let's have a look at our first feature that we are putting out. So the first feature we're using is we're using the pattern four split by architecture pattern, and we're putting together a cloud infrastructure setup so that we can build our system on top of this. Now, the next one, we'll look at is we've taken this epic and we used the pattern one and we split those into the case types over here. OK, so we've got family law, criminal law and corporate law. OK, again, notice we have maintained the value. If we were to uh, release any one of these to market, we could retrieve uh, market share, which was one of our most important things. But also we could start to obtain revenue for that as well, which I'm sure is very important so that you can reinvest that in later cycles of the project and the program as well. Now, if we look at family law and we see that we have split that out into two different features, we have a look and we can see we've got one which is using the family court system integration. You'll note this is red and these are the red ones are called enablers and these could be to do with infrastructure, these could be to do with investigations or anything of that, that sort. And so this one is to do with an investigation to see how we can obtain data from the family court system and how we can bring that into our system as well. And then the next, and the next feature that this has been split into is the family divorce law. So that again, you can actually see that this is a valuable feature that uh, actually delivers value to the market. Feature number four, we've got uh, the criminal law has been split out and we've used the, the pattern, which is to split out by the data type over here. And we can see we're using the case law only data type over here. Again, whilst we don't provide precedence and commentary here. We're still releasing some value. And finally, for the corporate law, we're doing pattern number six, which is um, splitting by the data source. So we're getting only the Supreme Court data for this particular feature as well. So all in all now, we've got five features 
that we have now put together, if you look at them, the vast majority of them, especially those in, in blue, are valuable. The, the other two are necessary enablers for these three features that we are going to be taking into our PI planning. So we'll be taking all five features into our PI planning. And if you look at these, these are now split in as valuable way as we can possibly come up with. I'm sure if you could come up with something else, please let me know, put it in the comments. I'm sure there are lots of ways, as I said, that you can slice this challenge and this problem as well. I will also put the uh, relevant document in the description below so you can access that and you can download it at your own leisure as well. So I hope you found that useful. We looked at so many different things in terms of what was important in terms of splitting up problems, how it makes a massive difference, how Apple used it to dominate a market and an industry in fact, and also how we applied that for just our Justice Inc. example. Now in the next video, we're gonna take these and we're gonna see how we create amazing requirements. We're gonna look at the features. We're gonna look at how we create awesome features. And so we can start to get ready for our PI planning. So still lots of uh, exciting stuff remaining. Till I see you next time, love learning, keep growing, and don't forget to bring the joy. See you later and see you in the next video. Take care, goodbye.